apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse number four, and this is the, the verses four through fourteen. I'm going to try getting through some of them. Won't get through all of them. This is a lot of passage to go through. Verse number four, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Amen. Having predestinated, having predestinated us unto the, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, Amen. according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved, in the beloved. In verse number seven, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Look at how many times he's talking about the riches of his grace and the and the power and the, and the blessings and all that comes with him. In verse number seven, it says, "In whom we have redemption through his blood." It doesn't say through our works. It doesn't say through our baptism. It says through his blood. Then it says in verse number eight, "Wherein he hath he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence." Prudence is a pretty awesome word. If you've learned to study what that means, it'll be a good thing. Verse number nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure, which he um, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And when is that? It's happened. It's now. That's now. It's not later. That's now. Okay. Verse number eleven. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him Amen. who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye, ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, right. which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of our purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So if you look at these passages, there's a lot of words that jump out at us that can kind of get scary. If you've been into a church any length of time, you start hearing certain words, you start hearing the word predestined, or chosen, or good pleasure of his will, or there's another one that the counsel of his own will in verse number 11. When you start hearing this, it kind of creeps up saying, whoa, this is kind of strange language. Because we've been, we, if you turn the radio for any length of time at a gospel station, any length of, any length of time on a Christian radio station, you're going to hear something called Calvinism come creeping through the radio station. And it will come out and say that, hey, only those who are the elect will go to heaven. Well, that's what they yeah. teach. And that's what, that's what they come and take this passage. Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2 is full of Calvinist words that they have hijacked, they have twisted the meaning of context, and they have jumped on it, and these are some things that I think, and I'm not going to sit here and fight against everybody who believes in Calvinism, there's a lot of people who honestly don't know, because they've never actually studied the Bible, right. their idea of studying the Bible is to read a couple verses and go to a commentary, or to study the Bible to find out, or what you listen to the preacher says, or this radio guy says, or a website says, to understand the Bible, <laughs> or a YouTube video. Whatever it may be, but we don't understand the Bible for ourselves. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God teaches us all things. So instead of right. instead of letting the Bible interpret itself, we jump to man's wisdom to explain God's wisdom. And anytime you have man's wisdom trying to explain God's wisdom, what do you come up with? Heresy. Yeah. All the time. Right. Misunderstanding. So I want to show you this. First of all, I want to show you in verse number four. According as he hath chosen us. Amen. That's what it says, right? Before the foundation of the world. Is that what it says? Well, yes, it says that, but I'm missing something important, am I not? I'm missing a preparational phrase that actually de determines who are chosen. Okay? So we're going to go back and read verse number four very carefully. According as he hath chosen us before, there I missed it again, he hath chosen us where? In him. Now, in this passage, while I'm teaching, and I hope you can do both things at one time, if not, take the time right now and ignore me. It's going to be okay. I'm not giving you permission to do this. 
all right, these Amen. lines have got to stop. But get get a hold of your a pen or a pencil or a marker or something, a highlighter. Don't get a magic marker. But go through your Bible in this passage and underline or circle in him, in Christ, in Christ, in the Lord, in Jesus, in him. And look at the words in him. Anytime it says him or in God, in Christ, or anytime it has that phrase of in Christ Jesus, okay? And take note of that in this chapter. Anytime you talk about in Christ or in him, the key is to be in Christ. Amen. God does right. not elect some to heaven and some to hell. God has never done that. I do believe that there are such things as reprobates, but those people have had a, an equal <coughs> opportunity. They have given, they have been given opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, and they have rejected Jesus Christ. And so God has rejected <coughs> them. God, is, it could be one time. It could be one time that they heard the gospel, they rejected it, and then God says, "That's enough." I don't know how much timetable it is, but it's been preached long before I've ever heard of it. It's been, it's been, it's been preached long before I've ever been heard of. But the Bible teaches us where if God has only I've heard this my whole life, God is a gentleman. He does not force himself on anyone, and he gives everyone an opportunity to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. There are some people who are going to receive, and there's going to be those who reject. But it's not because it's not because God has chosen them to be saved or not. The Bible right. says in verse number four that we are chosen in him. He has chosen us in him. To say that God elects some to heaven and some to hell, that isn't sovereign. That's not sovereign does divine election. And it's not evolutionary nature, natural selection. It's, this is the two things that we find on opposite extremes. Well, it's all of God, or it just so happens to be, and it leaves us to chance. Evolution is based on the premise, or based on the theory, that only the strong will survive. We know this is stupid. That's why we have modern medicine. This is why we have doctors. This is why we have crutches. This is why we have uh, you know, fluid pills. This is why we have sleeping pills and wake-up pills. This is why we have coffee. Amen? Yeah. Because only the strong will survive. If it wasn't for coffee, how many of us had a coffee this morning in some <laughs> shape or form? I had decaf. It does nothing for me, but it tastes good. Okay? I don't drink caffeine. I gave up caffeine about 14, 15 years ago. It was controlling me, and I said no more cold turkey. I stopped drinking caffeine wholeheartedly. All right, seriously, we get a fly mm -hmm. Um Evolution is based on, maybe you should stop drinking coffee. But anyways, it's based on the premise that only the strong will survive, that there is no intelligent design, and that things just happen. That's what Kelvin, that's that's kind of what this what people think of. I seriously can't stand flies. Evolution is based on that premise. But then also there's fatalism that says the same thing, and that things will be what things will be. It is what it is. Evolution is nothing more than fatalism. Evolution says, well, it just happened to happen. Here's the circle of life. Whatever be, will be. I can't change it. I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. That's fatalism. Fatalism says there's nothing I can do to change it. But how much does that actually sound like what we present as Calvinism today? What people present as Calvinism is what will be, will be. Instead of saying fate or what will happen will be, and I can't do anything about it, nature is nature, now we put the same implements of the things of nature, and we attribute those to the God, to God, and we attribute those to a sovereign, knowledgeable, all sufficient, all wise, omnipotent God, and we take the same premise. Well, God won't change. God's the same yesterday, and God is the same yesterday, today, forever. Amen. He has not changed, nor will He ever change. It is impossible for Him to change. Right. But we take the same thing. Well, God, what, what God allows, will allow. And we take the same thing, the fatalism and, and, and uh, natural selection and evolution, we take that, those same principles and we put them towards the things of God. And we attribute them as well. If, you're, if, you're, if you are saved, you'll endure. Well, you're not saved. If you're meant to endure, then you're saved. But if you're not meant to endure, you're not saved. Hmm. Perseverance of the saints. That is, in essence, what evolution teaches and it's being, it's being preached from pulpits today as right. in the form of called doctrines of grace. Well, I've studied grace, and I can tell you that's not grace. That's saying that God has no control of the affairs of man, that God cannot, that God does not see the heart of faith, and it totally violates Scripture. Now, I will say that not every person who gets up there and preaches Calvinism, 
as a ranked heretic. I think some people get up there with just ignorance. They don't know any better. Right. They're copying what they've heard in college. They've never been challenged to do anything different. In fact, when they're challenged with something different when they believe, they get a hold of their professors. They get a hold of their, of their college. They get a hold of the newest publication or the nearest study Bible or the newest commentary or they'll go listen to some higher name preacher instead of taking the word of God at face value and let the word of God teach us, we'll go up and say, well, we're just... Instead of being able to let the word of God explain itself to us, the Bible says the natural man perceiveth not the things that are of God. So if there's a person who can't understand the things of God, it's because either they're not walking in the Lord, they have some sin in their life that they're not, they're, they're, that they refuse to yield to the things of God, or they're not saved. It could be very simple that they're not saved. And I'm not saying that haughtily or to put people down. There are sometimes things that it's not for us to understand at that particular time. But if a person cannot ever understand anything regarding Scripture, ever, you've got to ask yourself, are they saved? Because the Bible says the Spirit of God teaches us in all things, and we have no need that any man should teach us. So if a person's reading the Word of God and they have a blank spot, it's drawing a blank, and they're not understanding the passage of Scripture, or any, or any passage of Scripture, you've got to ask yourself, are they actually reading the Bible? Are they coming with preconceived notions, trying to make God fit in their standard? Or are they saved? Right. And that's, that's a simple understanding from Scripture. So the Bible tells us here in this passage, in verse number 4 in Ephesians 1, it says, according as he has chosen us before the... I'm sorry, no, that's what the Bible says. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, what happened at the beginning of the foundations of the world that were chosen in him to begin with? Take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 13, if you would. Revelation chapter number 13. What happened to, What happened at the beginning of the world that would cause us to be chosen in him? Chapter 13, verse 8. All right. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are, are not written in the book of life, in the, the, book, of the, of the book of the life of the Lamb, slain before the what? Foundation. Foundations of the world. So those who are not saved, those who have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who was slain before the foundations of the world. That means that God had preordained Christ to be slain long before Israel rejected him as Messiah. Right. right. Long before Israel said no to the Messiah, they recognized God said he's going to be slain for our sins. He's going to be slain before the foundation of the world. That's the premise of why Christ came. Okay? So this, 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 this passage right here, if we read it wrong, can totally destroy a lot of doctrines if we just actually read the Bible as it says. Amen? So evolution is based on the premise that only the strong will survive, and there's no intel, intel, intelligent design, and that things will just happen. Fatalism says the same thing, and that things will be what things will be. It is what it is. Okay, sarah, sarah, it is what it is. Well, let's think. That's karma. No. Human will does not, when you stop and think of this part, human will does have a part in salvation. Yeah. Human will has a part in salvation. God is sovereign, man is responsible. Does anyone have a problem with that statement? That God is sovereign, man is responsible? Do we believe that God is sovereign, that God rules alone yeah. without any superseding power? Yeah. God is sovereign. We, we agree with that? Amen? Okay. Does anyone, have, does anyone here have a problem with that statement? Let's think it through. God is sovereign. God alone rules. Man is responsible. We are responsible for our sins. God is not responsible for Cain's murder of his brother. Right. God is not responsible for Cain trying to bring his work offering and that he gave him a second chance and he still refused it. Mm -hmm. God is not responsible for the homosexuals and abortions and adultery. Right. God's, not a, God's not responsible. A man is responsible for our sins. We're responsible for our sins. God is not. But yet God, in his sovereignty, understood the purpose that we are responsible as he provided a way of salvation long before man ever sinned. Right. That, is not take, that is not Calvinistic. That's straight out Bible. Understand that. But human will is that God is sovereign, man is responsible. By the way, that statement was made by a man named, his name is A.W. Pink, Arthur W. Pink, who is one of the most quoted Puritan writers or Calvinists in the modern in the modern sense in the modern era 
If you ever, go, if you go to mm-hmm. look up Calvinism and look up A.W. Pink, you will find that he is one of the most quoted Calvinists out there. He passed away a long, you know, a while back, whatever. He is a major name in Calvinism. You say, well, what's all the, what happened with all that? It's because, I think your brother's here, but um, it's because the, here's, a, here, here's this guy and his Calvinism. He stopped and says, God is sovereign, man is responsible. That's that's irrefutable fact. That's truth. That's good truth. Then it says this. The Bible says that man must obey the gospel. They have to believe the gospel. They have to come to the faith. They have to believe the gospel. We're not, look, we don't have to obey the commandments of Christ to get saved. The only command we're supposed to obey is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Didn't say get circumcised to get saved. Didn't get baptized to get saved. Not to go to church to get saved. Live a good life to get saved. No, the only command we're, we're told to give, the one we're told that we're supposed to obey for salvation, is to obey the gospel. And no. what is that? Believe in our heart. Confess with the mouth. Call upon him, and you'll be saved. No. That's right. it. In, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, Who hath believed our report? Who, who's going to believe it? Though there's a lot of people today who will not believe it because they've never been told it. They have not been told. Well, they know they have a head knowledge. They kind of have a figure. They have, a, they have understanding of it, but they don't know it. They don't know it. Ed could. I remember last year we're working on this. We're trying to get the building all done. We're trying to like we were pushing hard. It was right about this time. We're we're over here and we're trying to get the the lights all just done just right. And Ed, and I was sitting on this bench, sitting right about here, right about where you guys are at, there's a bench, and I'm trying to put lights together, trying to string lights together, and I kept on, he told me what to do, and I started using this, the wire strippers, and I kept stripping the wire too short. And there's this one particular, I don't know if we need to use that, I think we might have junked it. The wire got short, 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 it was like literally this far from, from the, it was like this far from the ballast. Like this far. I'm not an electrician, but I know you can't do much with a wire that thick. And I messed, I got it so messed up. Ed had to go in there and kind of, you know, work it, whatever. And he figured it out. I don't know if we still used it or not, but it was like, it was wrong. Because I had, he told me what to do, but I did not familiarize myself with it. I don't know. We have a lot of people today who know John 3.16, yeah. but they don't know John 3.16. Right, right. They have, a, they have a knowledge that there's a God, but they don't know there's a God. They know the Bible is true, but they don't know the Bible is true. They know they're supposed to, you know, you know, they know, they know they're supposed to pray, but they don't know how to pray. Mm-hmm. I mean, they can, they can, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, or Lord, give me the serenity to help me do the change of thing, da da da, whatever that serenity prayer. I don't know the prayer, but it's like all this different. You know, we know we said it prayers, but we don't know prayer. We say we know God, but we don't know God. So when we come, we're supposed to know the Bible. We're supposed to know the gospel, excuse me, to know the gospel to get saved. The gospel is this. We're dirty, rotten, hell-bound sinners. Yeah. We can't save ourselves, and that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross right. for our sins. Right. The sinless Son of God who died on the cross for our sins paid our payment full in his death, burial, and resurrection. And the only thing we can do to inherit or to obtain eternal life is to believe on his name. Right. That's it. Yeah. But how many of us today go to a church down the road or up the road or anywhere else and they'll teach you anything but that? They'll mm-hmm. teach you, hey, you got to repent of all your sins and believe on Jesus. Mm-hmm. Or you got to do this, this, and believe. But how many times we, we don't know the truth? But human will does has a part in salvation. But uh, this doesn't say in verse 4 that we chose him, but that he chose us. See the difference? Verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, they must repent towards God and have faith towards Jesus Christ. Man cannot and will not turn, seek, trust, understand, except they are drawn. The Bible teaches that in the Bible teaches that in the book of John. The Bible yeah. says that no man cometh to the Father, you know, except I draw them. So no one comes to God except he draws them. That's right. Now who is God drawing? <coughs> The Bible says in John chapter 12, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Was Christ not lifted up? Then he's still drawing all men unto himself. Amen. That's right. So there's some people say that, oh, God only chooses certain people to be drawn to him. The Bible says that he has drawn all men. So what about those people who have utterly rejected Christ? Has Christ not drawn them? 
Oh, he's drawn them, but they refuse. Right. They would have none of his reproof. They would not anything of his word. So one does not choose to be saved. I want to make this perfectly clear, okay? One does not choose to be saved. One does not go there and say, you know what? Yeah, I'll go ahead and get saved today. Yeah, right. That's not what happens. I'm a, no, we have to go to them with the gospel. We go to them and say, hey, this is the truth. Right. Are you willing to receive Christ today? They have to be prompted with the truth of God in order to get saved. But they don't suddenly wake up and say, you know, I'm going to get saved today. Yeah. I think I'll go wash the car today. I think I'll get saved today. I'm going to seek it out on my own. No one of his own chooses to be saved. They're not, they're not chosen to be saved. Well, no individual person is chosen to be saved. Eh, I choose Dan, but not Charlene. I'll choose Gabe, but definitely not Mateo. That's not, that's not, that's not how God does it. Nor does one decide one day he's going to wake up and go, Oh, you know what? I'm going to get saved today. I decided my own I'm going to get saved. The Bible says no man seeketh after God. No man comes to the Father but on his own on his own will. Go to Romans chapter number 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 3. Verse number 10. <clears throat> As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that, what? Seeketh after God. Does anyone, any lost person out there seeking after God? Not on their own accord. Now the Bible does say those that seek me early shall find me. But they don't come on their own accord. It's because they're being drawn. They're being drawn of the Holy Spirit. They're being called and wooed by that Holy Spirit. And there's, there's, a different, there's different doctrines of Calvinism I could chase on that one. But I'm not preaching Calvinism today. Because I'm going to preach the gospel today and preach what is right, whether what's wrong. Amen? But one does not choose to be saved, but they must willfully obey the gospel or they will not be saved. They have to willfully obey the gospel. They cannot be hogtied. They can't be strong-armed. They can't be deceived. Right. They have to willfully obey the gospel. Go to the book of John, please. The book of John, chapter number 1. See, the thing is, some people can say something that sounds really, really good. Sounds really, really tempting. I mean, really, like, right there, it's alluring. It's, mm, it's so almost right there. It's like, almost right there. It's like you go to this restaurant, and, man, they have this great big steak. I'm talking about juicy, cooked yeah. just right, baked potato, no butter, oh, no on. sour cream. No, I'm no, trying to help right, your... Yeah. Trying to, trying to help with your diet, brother. Yeah. Then they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get everything just right. Oh, I, I'm trying here. I'm really am. We're trying to get everything just perfectly right. And get everything all just put on your potato. Just everything just looks so perfect. You know, you know, everything tastes delicious. And then they come out and they bring out this cart of desserts. And you're like, oh man, I love apple pie. This time of year is apple pie season. Not quite pumpkin pie, but it's apple pie season. Apples are just looking really good. They look delicious. You bite into a Macintosh right about now, and it's like, man, it's like smack your mama good. I mean, it tastes delicious. And you start making stuff up, and you start making your apple sauce, and your apple jam, your apple bread, your apple pie. It tastes delicious. And they bring out that apple pie, and they say, would you like a great big slice of apple pie with ice cream and whipped cream on top? And you're like... <laughs> and you say to yourself, ah, it looks irresistible. Right? And then they go on to get you that, except for Mateo. Mateo says he doesn't like eating desserts on a full stomach. Amen. And I'm like, he, would, he says, I don't like fruit. I don't like, I'm like, seriously, this guy's not safe. But it's like, but it's like, he, but, um, can you imagine that? Here's a great big slice of apple pie, and it's just apple caramel pie. It's just delicious. There it is on your plate. And they come out in this great big, great big slice, and they say, would you like a slice of pie along with each for your, for your dessert? And you sit there, and you struggle between it, and you just finally say, yes, I'll take the slice of apple pie. And then you take the first couple bites, you're like, oh, I regret it. I wish I never did. And you leave it there, and you say, I don't want, unless it's nasty, you don't want, like, mm, crab apples, what's wrong with you people? And it's like, no, it's like, no, everybody usually goes, oh, it's so good, but I'm going to take it home with me. 
right? It's usually how pie goes, right? So what happens is with the gospel, is we hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It gets presented to us, and we know we're sinners, and we need Jesus Christ, and we're given an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. People who are called Calvinists, they believe this doctrine that says, you cannot say no to God. That you cannot say no to God. Does the Bible do not say you taste the Lord and see that he is good? Mm-hmm. It does. And God is good. How many of us have tasted and found the Lord gracious? Amen. Amen. So we have Amen. found the Lord gracious, and he is what we need in our life. He is good. Amen. But they say that no one can say no to God. That if God is vying for your soul, that God will strong arm you until you do accept him. That's not the God that I, that's not the God that I find in scripture. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse number 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him. No? No? Oh, okay. What Bible version are you guys using? All right, it says in verse number 11, He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. Amen. Now, here's the part that Calvinists will use to destroy altogether. And I'm going to teach you the reason how they destroy it, okay? Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, we don't choose to be saved. That is facts. We don't choose in our own selves to be saved. Neither does God strong arm us, strong arm us to get saved. But there is a perpetual, effectual calling of the Holy Spirit in wooing to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, convicting the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And if we don't believe on him, and the Holy Spirit is teaching us, if we do not believe on him, we are rejecting Jesus Christ. Right. So we don't get saved because we decide to get saved. We get saved because we surrender to the Holy Spirit's wooing and we obey the gospel. Amen. 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 Right. Okay? But Calvinists will take this verse and they'll take it and say, you're born spiritually, not of blood. You're not born because of your of your of your, you know your of your race, except you know by your, your decree, unless you're Jewish and you're automatically saved, some people think. Nor of the will of the flesh, by what your desire is so strong to just come to God because you want something good. Our flesh is wicked. The Bible says our heart is sinful, our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In our own selves, there is no good thing. The Bible says, for all have what? Sin and come short of the glory of God. So we in ourselves are wicked and we're helpless to ourselves. We cannot seek after God. We don't know God. The Bible says there's none that do it good, no, not one. Okay? So it says in verse 13 that we're not born of the blood, not, not of our, not mom or daddy, sister, brother, great grandma, it doesn't matter. We're not born of the flesh. We're not born of, we're not of the will of man by us choosing it or by the preacher choosing it, right. but by the will of God that we're saved. Right. Yeah. That's how we're chosen. It's by, that's because it's by God's will. Now go back to John chapter 14. Jesus saith unto him, verse number 6, I am a way, a truth, and a life. No. 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 I'll try it again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Understand that we know that part, right? No one comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. Right. He is the one who has been chosen. And we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are chosen to be in Christ. We are predestinated, the Bible says, to be in Christ. And we have to be accepted. Go back to Ephesians. We have to be accepted in the beloved. What that means is we have to be approved. We have to be accepted in him. Just as as a figure, just as a figure, it's not a true, not a true thing, but it's a figure. Even as Noah had to be in the ark. And his family had to be in the ark. We have to be in Christ. Right. It's not in the church. It's not 
in a Baptist denomination or Baptist name. Right. It's not being in the new IFB or the old IFB. It's to be in Christ. He is the chosen. He is the elect. He is the one that Christ chose to be the only way of salvation. He is the elect, and we have to be in the elect. Now, because we are in that ark, because we are in Jesus Christ, because we are in the elect, we are the elect. Right. Amen. Understand that difference? We're not the elect, and that's why we get saved. We're saved, and that's why we're the elect. Right. Okay? We have, we have got to be in the ark. We've got to be in Jesus Christ. Right? So, we have to be chosen in him. And so... The, the, again, Calvinists will say that all you've got is pre, God predestines you and not you and you and you and not you and not you. That's just, that's just, no, that's not how God operates. That's not how God, God says this is Christ and anybody who's going to be saved is going to be saved in Amen. him before the foundations of the world. Jew or Gentile, Greek, male, female, it doesn't matter. You've got to be in Jesus Christ right. or you can't be saved. Right. That's what it's always been. It's not some new thing that Paul preached after the seventh dispensation. It was simply all the way from the beginning of time. It was always in right. Christ. You either receive God by faith or you're not saved at all. Calvinism teaches that it's a supernatural selection, just like evolution teaches. It's a natural selection. That's what they believe. It's a natural. It's a supernatural spiritual selection. Predestinated is a sovereign. Um, is a sovereign knowledge, irresistible grace, and we can't say no. It's his will, but God's sovereign as man is responsible still plays through. The Bible teaches salvation is for whosoever will believe. But now I'll ask this question in chapter verse number four. We've talked about that part in verse number four. Good, mm -hmm. right? But I want to show you some things beyond verse four. We got to verse four today. Aren't you guys thankful yeah. for that? <laughs> we got to verse four today. One verse. Hallelujah. All right, look at verse number four. I want to show you this in the next couple minutes. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. But what it, so it says here that he has chosen us that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. There's some things that were saved now that we've received Jesus Christ and we believed on him out of a pure heart. By the way, if you're here today and you've not come to God by faith, Trusting only in him. Not counting yourself reformed. If you want to reform your life, great. But it's not necessary for salvation. Right. You want to get baptized? Great. It's for believers only. It's not part for salvation. Right. If you want to if you want to live, if you want to get saved, it's simply by accepting the gift that God has given. A gift is not earned, it's freely given, Amen. it's freely bestowed. Okay? And it's freely received. But if we now that we're saved, that God wants something more from our life than just for us to go to heaven. He wants something more from our life. And in verse number four, you can ask this question, saved, but now what? Let me give you three things. We're saved to be holy. It says there in verse number four that we should be holy. God wants us to be holy, to be set apart, to be different from the world. Right. I'm not talking about going out there at the Browns game today, paint yourself a John 3.16 on your, on your bare shirt and wild, crazy hair and get out there in the freezing cold. And That's not being different. That's, not, that's being different, but it's not being different for a cause. Okay? God wants us to be set apart for his purpose. God wants us to be set apart just like a bride is set apart for her husband, and a husband is for her bride. God wants us to be saved. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be set apart. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. I got the sneaky feeling I should be saying 2 Peter. Yeah. Let me double check. No, that's right. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. That word conversation doesn't mean how we talk, but it's how we live. It's right. a manner of life. Okay? Right. So we're supposed to be holy in all manner of living. In all manner of living. Amen. That means Monday through Saturday and not Amen. just on Sunday. Right. Okay? I told you before about the juvenile prison coming in and working, and the guys would come in and get the praise on. 
and then live Italians the rest of the hour. Or, you know, we're not doing that, okay? We're supposed to be holy, set apart for God all of our life, okay? But we're supposed to be saved. We're saved, and we're to be holy. We're not to be holy to be saved. We're saved to be holy. Amen. There's an order. Amen. But the second thing, we're saved to be without blame. The Bible says that we're, that we're supposed to be holy without blame before him in love. So we're supposed to be saved. We're saved to be without blame before him. Right there in 2 Peter, right there in 1 Peter, could be 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye be seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and what? Blameless. blameless. God wants us to be blameless. <clears throat> accused, yes. Blameless, you know, accused, yes. Guilty, no. We're supposed to be blameless. That people can't lay hold against us and say, well, that person's living a double lifestyle. We all have things in our life we have to improve on a daily basis. Amen. For, like, for I'll say this, most of y'all here, I mean, all of y'all here are not fat enough. You guys get at work at getting fat. The Bible says the righteous soul shall eat fat, right? So I'm tired of trying to get down to your level. Come up to mine. Amen. No? Okay, I'll try to work. We all have things we have to work on a little bit better. You know, we all have things to improve on. But when we're a work in progress, it's one thing. When we refuse to be a work in progress, that's another. When we refuse correction, that's a different thing altogether. So we got to be without blame. You know, without without blame. Go to First um, Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five. Verse twenty-two and twenty-three. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's fully, W-H-O-L-Y, that means fully, right, complete. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and, body, and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So God wants us to be without blame before him in love. We look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, verse, verse 15, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8, that we're supposed to be blameless before him. Before others, before him, we're supposed to be blameless. So we're saved. Now what? Be holy. Be blameless. But lastly, we're supposed to be before him in love. Go to Jude chapter number, go to Jude chapter number one. There's only one chapter in Jude. So Jude, verse 21. Find Revelation, go back a couple pages and find Jude. Jude chapter two. Or if you're like our guy Mark last week, it's not Jude, it's Jude. <laughs> There's a guy last week. You guys, there's a guy last week. Josh Jesus. threw out of the church Zoom services. Threw out. He came in here. He was like, just being a rascal, throwing stuff around, being an idiot. Josh escorted him out of the building. That was kind of interesting. He's like, there's not a book of Job. Job. It's a book of Job. It's a book of Job. J O B J O B. Right. Got it. Thank you. Jude. Jude verse. Uh, Jude verse twenty one. Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We're supposed to keep ourselves how? In love. It is easy to be right, isn't it? <laughs> Ladies got this part down. It's easy to be right all the time. But we're supposed to be right in love. I got your back. <laughs> no, I got your check. It's okay. We're supposed to be we're supposed to we're supposed to be we are supposed to be truth. We're supposed to speak the truth in love. And we need to keep ourselves in love. I'm not saying be soft milk, soft spoken, Joe Osteen. I'm talking about we're supposed to be truthful and speak the truth in love. We've got to be able to speak the truth in such a way where people, you look how Christ said things. Now, there's times where Christ said it flat out, no, no kids love. But Jesus spoke in such a way that still had healing in his wings. He, he spoke with grace and truth. We need to speak with the love of God. We need to have the love of God in us and with us. And in, right. in 2 John chapter 1, there's only one chapter in 2 John, but if you can go to 2 John, which is one page to your, to your, le to your left, 2, jo uh, 2 John verse 6, it says this, And this is love. I'll go back in verse 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, <laughs> amen, not as though I wrote a new commandment, I'm this is the church here, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we should love, that we love one another. And this is love, 
that we walk after his commandments. That this, that this is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. We're supposed to walk in the commandments that he gave. And what are the commandments he gave? We're supposed to love the Lord thy God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. What? Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we don't love one another, even as we love ourselves, and we don't love God right, we're not going to love our neighbor right. And if we say we love our neighbor right, and we don't love God right, we're hypocrites. We're wrong. If our love for our neighbor supersedes and, and changes how we view God, then it's wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if our love of God is right, it's going to be demonstrated towards others right. right. So the Bible tells us, say, now what? Be holy, be blameless before him. How? In love. If we can get those three down, everything else will fall into place. Amen? Right. We can get saved. We live our life holy, blameless, and before him in love. Everything else is easy peasy. Right. And nothing too hard because his, his commands are not grievous. We can handle everything else from there if we have the right love one for another. We are holy and blameless before him in love. And 1 John 4, verse number 16, this is my last verse. And we know, and we have known and believed the love that God hath, hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love, dwelleth, um, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. We live our life in the love of God is because God dwells in us right. and we in Him. Right. You find someone who can't display any love, that has no love of the brethren, that has no I'm not talking about the huggy go feeling and flowers and I'm talking about the love that we have one for another. If we don't have love in our heart for the brethren, something's wrong with our love of God. Right. Right. Something I'm not saying you're not saved, I'm saying something's wrong with the love you have for God. Your walk with God is not right if you don't love the brethren. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done or what measure they meet up to for you. If you can't love a brother or sister in Christ the way that God loves us, something's wrong. Yeah. That's why the Bible says we're supposed to. We're supposed to. You know, we're saved to be holy, to be without blame, and to be before Him in love. But again, it's not in order to be saved. It's because that we already are. Yep. It's cause and effect. All right. Anyways, if you have any questions, we can talk about it through fellowship. There's some. Pumpkin bread and some apple walnut bread. My wife made the pumpkin bread. It's pretty good, actually. And not that she didn't cook it. I'm saying it's really good. And then there's an apple walnut bread that Abba y'all made. So there's one next door during the fellowship hall. We'll take time in fellowship. We'll have our service start at 11. And let's go ahead and pray for God's blessing on our fellowship. And uh, Brother Bob, if you would please read us in prayer. Father, we thank you for the time to be here with these people, Lord. We thank you for your word this morning. And we just uh, pray, Lord, that we each apply it to our lives. Father, we just uh, ask you to be with us in time of fellowship, Lord, and uh, look forward to the service and what you have for us. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.